Brilliant. So I think we will get started. So as I said, this is a webinar um, optimizing your chances of conception with PCOS and endometriosis. And if you do have questions, please put it in the chat box and I'm going to try and answer them as we go along if they're relevant to the point that we're the slide we're talking about just to make sure that we don't miss anything but we actually have a Q&A at the end so if there's anything I miss uh, don't worry because there will be time for that as well and like I said the webinar will be recorded so perfect time to introduce yourself Isabel and like I said thank you so much for joining us today oh well you're welcome um, I, my name is Isabel Aubert and I'm a nutritionist. I've been in, specialising in fertility and IVF for about 20 years. I've worked closely with Zeta for most of those. Um, and uh, yes, I, we obviously I, I work alongside people who are going through fertil uh, fertility treatment, but also people who are just trying to conceive and people with hormonal imbalances, such as the ones that we're going to talk about today, i.e. PCOS and endometriosis, which, uh, which are you know, really quite pre prevalent these days, actually. And I don't know, it's probably because the knowledge is more and people have more understanding of it. Um, but, you know, I try and work as as easily as I can. And when I say that, I mean to make life easy because, you know, things can be very, very complicated. Conditions are very complicated, but there's often nutritional uh, support that can be done quite easily without too much stress. And it's really trying to take the stress out. Yes, demystify, I know it says on that. It's basically... You know, when you're looking at a, um, you know, I don't know, a, a book or an Instagram or, or or a blog, you can't talk to it. So this is really just trying to, you know, clarify things and make life not so difficult because it can be such a stressful time. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. No, thank you for um, yeah, introducing yourself. And some of you might have spoken to Isabel before as well. If you ever got in contact with our customer service as well, um, Isabel is um, on there as well. And I am Rebecca. I work alongside Isabel. I'm also a nutritionist and work um, alongside Zeta um, for formulating the products. So first of all, we're going to go on to talking a little bit about the symptoms and diagnosing PCOS and endometriosis. I think a lot of you who are joining this evening probably have a quite good understanding. Maybe you have a diagnosis currently. Maybe you suspect that you might have PCOS or endometriosis. So some of this might be knowledge for you, but I think it's going to be really helpful when we're tying in the bits further on about nutrition, supplements and lifestyle, just to make sure we have all of this covered. So maybe I thought would be really interesting to start off with Isabel is just yeah. discussing the causes of PCOS and endometriosis. I know you mentioned that cases might be rising at the moment, maybe that's because we know more about them, but do we know why um, these symptoms occur? Um, the answer, the, the short answer is not really. <laughs> um, so with PCOS, it can be, that's very much, it can be hereditary. Um, and essentially it, um, it is based on hormonal imbalance, particularly higher androgens, which are the male hormones, which then give rise to the symptoms such as potentially more facial or body hair, um, acne, sometimes uh, hair loss and male pattern baldness, and also anovulation, i.e. not ovulating, so irregular mm -hmm. periods, because that's a, that's a really big issue. Um, it is actually a, a chronic sort of low-grade inflammation, which stimulates Polycystic ovaries, these are not cysts, by the way, they are multifollicular ovaries, and you can have multifollicular ovaries without having PCOS. But if you've got this low-grade inflammation, it can it can um, basically trigger the um, ovaries to, to produce, uh, to, to become anovulatory and to produce more testosterone. It gives rise to higher testosterone. And there's an in insulin, um, there's also insulin resistance, or uh, which, which can be an issue. Is it the chicken or the egg? Obviously, is it? Does it start with insulin resistance? But actually, uh, hyperinsulinemia, i.e., too much insulin, can also uh, trigger higher testosterone levels, and then that goes back to the uh, reducing the um, uh, basically causing the ovaries not to function properly and then a hormonal imbalance. So, what? How does it start? We're not quite sure, uh, but certainly there is a hereditary uh, aspect to it. But potentially, it could be this, you know, this underlying inflammation. And there's a lot of inflammation going on around isn't there, Rebecca, uh, uh, sort of in the modern world, many things cause inflammation. And that is also at the basis of endometriosis. So with endometriosis, it is not an autoimmune condition, but it has, there are, they're, they're doing studies and there are definitely autoimmune links. 
So we don't think that it is caused, but, but there are autoimmune links and certainly there are links with uh, the microbiome and it, sort of uh, the, the dysbiosis and disrupted microbiome. And obviously the gut is our largest immune organ. So that can give rise to autoimmune type conditions. And again, it's, it's a pro-inflammatory uh, condition that is a, sort of increases estrogen actually, and it is also estrogen led. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so, so essentially, both of them can be, um, we're not sure, nobody really knows whether it's environmental, uh, yeah. potentially it is, whether it is something within oneself, but they both, it seems, seem to be more prevalent. And I think probably a lot of that is because we are now know more about them and particularly the diagnosis of PCOS is, is easier. Yeah, yeah. So that actually brings us on to the next point um, really nicely is actually how do we diagnose PCOS? So you talked about um, some of these signs that you might see, but if either like you were saying, you might be watching this and if you are happy to share in the chat, I think that would be great to share sort of your story. If you are watching this saying that I have a PCOS diagnosis, or maybe you're watching this suspecting you have PCOS and maybe going through this diagnosis process, but how does that look like for someone? So you've got the multi, what's called a polycystic ovary, which is essentially a multifollicular ovary. It's, it's, as I said, these aren't actually cysts. That, you know, that, that's a starting point. Although, well, it's not a starting point. It's one of the features, obviously. Yeah. But, but, and you can, as I said, you can have multifollicular ovaries without having the syndrome. This, with the syndrome, you have to have certain features. So high androgen levels tend to be, a, a, it's a, which is high testosterone. Androgens are the male hormones. So it tends to be, which then if you've got more male hormone, more testosterone, it can affect the way you produce progesterone and estrogen because all our sort of hormones work in connection with each other. You've got, so it, which leads to uh, irregular ovulation or non-ovulation and ovulation. I mean, there are, you know, women with PCS who don't ovulate at all. That is, that can be an issue. So that we've got the hormone imbar imbalance. Um, it can be, so the, the, the high androgens can be linked with, um, say, excessive body hair or facial hair potentially male pattern baldness um acne um and also the insulin resistance is also one so essentially insulin um inappropriate insulin response or not a, a effective insulin response is definitely one of the features um yeah. uh, with and there can be weight gain it's not with always you can be very slender and and, and happy os um there are different features but there, generally you're expected to have several of these and so essentially you would need a hormone test wouldn't you to um to to, to diagnose it's it, you'd probably need a scan but you'd also need hormone tests you couldn't just look mm. at somebody and go oh I think you've got them you know I think you'd need to yeah. go a bit more deep than that yeah yeah and you touched upon some of those symptoms that are also on uh, this slide as well but is these symptoms that we've listed are the irregular periods, excess androgen levels, this male hormones, um, talk about weight gain, acne. Do they affect everyone with PCOS the same or is there going to be almost a bit of a spectrum with how people are affected? Yeah, completely, actually. It's a complete spectrum, um, you know, and that, as I said, I've touched a bit earlier on. So uh, quite a common really one is people finding it hard to lose weight, particularly weight, weight around the middle where actually you have your most insulin receptors and so you know you are prone to putting on weight and it's the sort of pre-diabetic style of weight if you like uh, but you don't have to uh, have trouble with weight some women with PCOS actually have regular periods as well um and they seem to ovulate I mean it's it, it's one of those things that that it's the, the point really being that, that, that with um with polycystic ovaries um if you've got the that the weight that maybe the hair or the acne and things that that can impact your life that can be if mm. you're trying to conceive so so that's without trying to conceive that can impact yeah. your life of course if you're trying to conceive obviously you need to be ovulating and if you've got very regular periods or potentially you're not ovulating properly or if you know again your your hormones are disrupted so are you producing enough progesterone um it's there are all sorts of things that can be very distressing um yeah. so but it's it's very different with everybody and people have different experiences that's for sure yeah yeah and a few people now actually in the chat um which is really amazing and um, that you're all sharing talking about just their diagnosis PCOS when they got diagnosed um so thank you all for sharing them we're just reading through them now and if so if you are watching as well we are going to come on to endometriosis as well and um, we're just going to um cover the sort of foundations you like um, of each and then we're going to really dive into them and then just talking I guess 
I, there's a lot when it comes to nutrition. And I think it's a very, very overwhelming subject when we're talking about sort of diet. And there is maybe lots of different sort of field opinions. And there's lots of things that are going to work for different people. But when we maybe look at a PCOS diet, what for you is that made up of? So for, with PCOS, we're looking at the starting point really would be low GI or low GL. So the GI is the glycemic index. And the glycemic index is how fast it takes for a food to become sugar in your bloodstream, glucose in your bloodstream. And if it's at 100, like glucose, it goes into your bloodstream straight away. If it's down low, like a steak, for instance, I can see that, um, then it will very slowly, it won't turn into sugar really at all, but it doesn't give you the sugar spike because one of the issues with um, PCOS is this, uh, insulin resistance or uh, problems with producing insulin. So that the, it's 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 not that you've got too much sugar in the bloodstream. Actually, it's that your body can't can't deal with the sugar that goes in. Yeah. So a, a lower GI diet, i.e., foods that are lower on the glycemic index, so foods that are unrefined. So you don't you, the refined carbohydrates tend to you know that they don't have any fiber in them. They go into the bloodstream very quickly. Sugar, obviously, keeping your sugary foods down increasing your fiber is really really important increasing your protein so a higher protein lower carb never a no carb um although i say that some people say that the keto diet is very very beneficial for women with pcs the problem with with keto diets is they're not sustainable it's it's not yeah, sustainable to carry on long term with that so i would always say a higher protein lower carb uh, diet obviously we're back to the mediterranean diet actually because we're looking at the inflammation as well so you don't want just your proteins to come from steak and um sort of red meat because that's high in uh it's high in saturated fat is potentially pro-inflammatory same with the high fat dairy so again we're looking at proteins that are more anti-inflammatory like the fish oily fish pulses nuts and seeds um eggs and steak and things like that so a colorful diet but eating regularly is really really important sort of smaller amounts not leaving very long gaps um so it's 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 a mediterranean style diet but high in fiber high in uh, reasonably high in protein um low in in you know keeping the, the carbohydrates complex preferably low in sugar and refined foods really and processed foods and of course things yeah processed foods and also um artificial um well, artificial flavorings and things but artificial sweeteners they are very pro-inflammatory yeah yeah. And you also mentioned about blood sugar, which I think is a really key point that comes up a lot when we think about PCOS. And again, I think it can be, I mean, it's probably something that I've said as well when to what diet, I'm like, oh, just make sure you're controlling your blood sugar balance. But I think that is such a almost broad statement. So if you could maybe just dive into a little bit about what does that actually mean and why is it so important? So when you, it depends on how, yeah, how quickly uh, food enters. So Food, everything that we eat has to be broken down to its smallest molecule before we can absorb it. And carbohydrates turn into sugar. And sugar, the smallest molecule is glucose. So we're going down to it's the blood glucose. Mm -hmm. But carbohydrates can be everything from obviously, you know, the obvious things like potatoes and rice and things to a banana or an apple. I mean, fruit is often is essentially it's a fruit, but it, it can be classed as a carbohydrate. It does break down into sugar. Fructose is a fruit sugar. So um, and there are Foods that go, in, go into your bloodstream more quickly as sugar. So if you had a bowl of white rice, that would go into your bloodstream more, it would turn into sugar more quickly in your, in your bloodstream than a bowl of brown rice, for instance, which has, still has the husk, which has got more fiber. Fiber tends to slow down the absorption of sugar. So we've got a slower release. And if you then add protein and fat to your meal or your snack, protein and fat, and on the whole, protein and fat come together. So if you think about it, you know, most meats and fish and eggs and things will all have a bit of fat or nuts and seeds, and, um, you know, so generally they go together. But protein and fat reduces the speed at which sugar, the carbohydrates turn into sugar. So by including some kind of protein um, and fat, if you like, with every meal as well, you have a slower release. And so you don't spike because the problem is, is when you get a sugar spike, when sugar enters the bloodstream, the pancreas has to secrete insulin to take sugar out of the bloodstream. And with PCOS, that is potentially a problem uh, because the insulin doesn't function as well as it could. And yeah. as we know before, high, very high insulin levels, you know, sort of chronic insulin levels can give rise into hormone imbalance, including um, increased androgens. And then we're back to the full circle again. 
Yeah, yeah. And I think a really good point that you mentioned is not thinking about foods in isolation. I think that's something that we can, and a lot of time in the media as well, we can be very dangerous falling into saying avoid this food and X, Y, Z. Obviously, there are some foods that we do want to minimize, especially when we're thinking about PCOS, when we're thinking about fertility. But I think it's remembering it's a food matrix. We're not eating food in isolation. And like you were saying, pairing it with that um, protein and fat is going to be really important. Yeah. And I tend to say, try and include protein and color every time you eat. So protein, the color being, as I say, not Skittles, preferably, but things like, you know, veg, some fruit, but it was less fruit. Um, and a small amount of carbohydrate potentially um, because you don't want to be carb free. Uh, yeah. You know, it's important you get the B vitamins, you get the fiber, you know, you get a lot of benefits from having complex carbohydrates. Yeah. And we did actually just get a question in here and someone has asked, they'd be interested in how over and under active thyroid um, impacts this as well. And does it impact any of the recommendations? Well, it's interesting, actually, that question, because if you've got PCOS, you have you're three times more likely to be to have hypothyroid issues, hypothyroid, so a, a slightly underfunctioning mm-hmm. thyroid. Um, so it does tend to go hand in hand. Um, and with it again, it's it, it sort of again, yes, with the thyroid, all our hormones work in, in connection with each other. Stress hormones, sex hormones, thyroid hormones, they all work synergistically. So essentially, the more balanced the hormonal system, the more efficiently the body works. And from a nutritional perspective, your starting point for hormone balance is balancing your blood sugar levels. So I would say that to anybody. It doesn't matter whether they're going for fertility, not fertility, male, female, got PCOS, and doesn't matter. Balancing mm. your blood sugar levels, in my opinion, is one of the most important things you can do, and you feel better for it. And you can, when yeah. you're used to it, you can tell if you don't do it, your heart starts beating, you feel a bit weird. You know, you sort of, you, you, you can tell, you, you can tell. So mm. with the thyroid, it sort of depends we go into the whether it's just a slightly underfunctioning thyroid, whether it's the in Hashimoto's, mm-hmm. and if it is Hashimoto's, then yes, potentially uh, we might recommend that you uh, avoid gluten, certainly wheat, potentially gluten, uh, sometimes dairy. So th- there are again, one size never fits all. Mm-hmm. That's the thing. It's it's a difficult one, but certainly balancing your blood sugar levels is really important for thyroid function because also thyroid function can or slightly under-functioning can be as a result of stress because the adrenals and the thyroid work very closely together. And so it's maybe looking at the way your body's reacting to stress. That, But balancing your blood sugar levels is always a good place to start. You can't go wrong with that, really, can you? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Really good starting point. And then that comes and um, brings us on to endometriosis. So could you just maybe touch on how does this differ when we're thinking about diagnosis? Um, how is this diagnosed and what is it looking like? So the diagnosis typically is shocking <laughs> and it's be you know, it has been, and I don't know if it still continues to be, you know, the diagnosis can take up to eight years. Mm. Um, and I have known of people who've been sent away going, oh, just take a painkiller when they're sort of crippled with pain. You shouldn't be crippled with pain. I mean, I think probably all of us have experienced some kind of period pain during our lives, uh, but being crippled with pain and not just period pain, potentially period of pain with sex, um, pain with when you having bowel movements, particularly when you've got your periods. And essentially, endometriosis is endometrial type tissue that grows outside of the endometrium where it shouldn't. Um, again, how does it happen? It can be what's called a um, retrograde menstruation, which means that menstrual blood flows black through the open tubes and starts settling around in the pelvic cavity and lodging there, which of course it shouldn't. We don't know why it does that. Certainly inflammation is is, is, is a big issue, as I say, um, estrogen, estrogen led potentially. And there are autoimmune links that I think they're, st- they're, be- they're continually being studied, but at the moment it's not classed as an autoimmune condition, but there are autoimmune links. And at the moment, the uh, really the only way I believe of um, diagnosing is via a, a laparoscopy. I, I'm not even sure that a, a sort of an, a, a, an even, even a, a transvaginal scan can tell you. Um, mm. There is a in currently in study at the moment, or they are looking to. There is potentially going to be, I think, a, a urine test that is being trialed at the moment, which will literally you know completely revolutionize the way yeah. that endometriosis is being because instead of 
taking because obviously with an with with laparoscopy that's a major so a laparoscopy is keyhole surgery where they they you you know it's under it's under general anesthetic and and they go in you know through your tummy button and and potentially through your ovaries and have a little look inside have a big look inside actually um mm. and they often during that if they see endometrial tissue they will they will laser it off or scrape it off i mean they they can look at see what's going on inside but at least the urine test will be able to tell whether or not you've got it within yeah. days i think so i have no idea when that will happen but i i you know, I think it's being trialed at the moment. So that would be amazing. Yeah, that would be, yeah, incredible. Because, yeah, Honor, thank you for sharing. Just said that it took 15 years to get... Um, and oh, maybe- God, I'm so sorry to hear that. Oh, yeah, I'm so sorry. I think it's... And it is something that we... I think it's really valuable looking out for those signs. And it's so hard when people say, yeah, that the sort of pain around your period. And it's one of these things that people are like, oh, but that's just that's just what it is but like you say it's it's not um if it is impacting your day-to-day life if it's impacting your routine then it is following up with with your healthcare professional which I know can be so so hard um but hopefully um I'm hoping that I think there are endometriosis clinics now being set up I mean it's becoming a lot more except you know sort of it's being dealt with more efficiently I believe um but um and as we are going to discuss a bit later on, Rebecca, there are things certainly that you can do that I think you can do even if you haven't had a diagnosis, to be honest, because there are things that we can do nutritionally and with supplements that may help because really it's easing the symptoms. And from a fertility perspective, um, the issues can be um, the that sometimes the bowel can get stuck to the, you know, to the tubes and I mean, it, it can cause problems, you know, yeah. inside as well as the inflammation, to be honest. Yeah. And then this is just a common question that comes up. So we just thought we would clear this up sort of early doors is adamiosis, which I think sounds a little bit similar and can be confusing with sort of which is which. So could you just explain a little bit about the differences and whether there's anything when we come on to talking about nutrition, lifestyle supplements, is there anything that should be approached differently? Well, I, it's essentially it, pretty much the same thing as in it is still endometrial style tissue, but instead of growing outside of the endometriosis, it grows within the uterine wall. Mm. So it grows sort of with, within the wall. So, uh, and again, it's a pro-inflammatory condition. I believe it should be treated the same. I can't, I can't see it's very, again, it's, we, we, we're not sure, but I can't see that it wouldn't be the same because it's essentially the same type of thing, but in a, in a slightly different place in, 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 in the pelvic cavity. I think, yeah, really helpful. And then sort of those classic symptoms of endometriosis. Um, and these are things that you probably see in your work most commonly that people are reporting. It's the the painful periods are probably the most obvious ones. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, when I say painful periods, I mean debilitating. You can't go to work. You know, you're, you're, you're in bed. People take, you know, there are women who take time off work every month. Mm-hmm. You shouldn't have to do that. Um, as I say, pain on 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 going to the loo, uh, particularly when you've got your period, pain during intercourse. Um, you know, headaches. I mean, just it's debility it's exhausting as well. Um, but th- it's really the pain that's probably the obvious one, the main one. Okay. And then when we're talking about nutritional strategies, how does this change with what we just discussed about PCOS? What are the main things that we should be thinking about and following? Well, actually, for endometriosis, a high fiber diet. I know I've d- I did mention that with endometri- with, with uh, PCOS as well, but high fiber is really important because so it, it, endometriosis is it, it it's estrogen led and it stimulates an uh, 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 an estrogenic sort of environment, if you like. So it stri- it stimulates it's almost stimulates more estrogen. So so estrogen dominance um, and fiber is really really important in order to bind to so all our hormones you know and toxins and stuff go through the liver to be sort of um, metabolized detoxified and and then they have to be excreted um so regular going to the loo regularly is really important because constipation can give rise to hormones and toxins being reabsorbed back into the body but high fiber the fiber will bind with these uh, these nutrient these not nutrients these old hormones so you can excrete them. Um, certainly reducing um, pro-inflammatory sort of high fat foods, high saturated fat. So like red meat, really keeping to an absolute minimum or cutting it out. Um, dairy is another, <laughs> dairy is another sort of, it has been um, in the past sort of 
be very much cut out dairy when you've got endometriosis. That's not necessarily true for everybody. In fact, they've done some studies whereby dairy might be beneficial. So if you are lactose or casein intolerance, it's intolerant, it's not going to be good for you. If you're not, dairy actually can be anti-inflammatory, bizarrely. Um, uh, gluten can be also pro-inflammatory. Again, one size doesn't fit all, but um, it is definitely something that I would often say, look, let's look at these things. Sometimes you just have to trial them, um, yeah. you know, just to see, but certainly an increased antioxidant intake, particularly cruciferous vegetables. So the cruciferous vegetables are things like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, things like that. And they contain compounds that are, that are really great for, um, for, for liver function, but also for helping clear away estrogens, actually. So um, yeah, there are certain uh, foods that can be really helpful, nuts and seeds, oily fish, because of the inflammation. So omega-3 is really important. Um, so it does differ slightly in that, um, whereas it's a higher protein, maybe um, lower, you know, diet for, for, for PCOS, for endometriosis, we're looking more at fiber really, actually mm -hmm. in some ways reducing some of the proteins, veg veg you know, vegetarian protein is potentially, and, and fish and things are potentially more beneficial in that respect. Yeah, and I think you mentioned the point about one size is for all, which I think is really important. No. And also try to see what works for you. I would say I always recommend to someone, if you are going to remove food groups from your diet, don't do them all at once. Absolutely. Don't wake up one day and say, I'm going to cut out gluten and dairy because one, it's you can be then at risk of nutritional deficiencies, but also you're not going to know which one is um, that may be the beneficial ones either um, add in or remove. So definitely approach them sort of um a single um group. absolutely and if you are going to do it you don't need to do it for months on end you wish you should feel the benefits within a few weeks really and often if you are if you are reacting to a food you feel and i'm not, not even talking about necessarily the sort of inflammation things you can often feel better within a few days funnily enough if you are reacting to something you can feel slightly different in a few days, but I certainly say two, at least two to three weeks if you can. But yeah, you're absolutely right, Becca. Don't do it all at once because, you know, it'd be great if you have benefits, but if you don't know what you're benefiting from, you're then cutting something out unnecessarily. And, and that's not, not, not the way to go, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, and we meant um, you mentioned a few times about inflammation, which I think is a really key point, especially for endometriosis, but I think PCOS as well. Yeah, we also want to be thinking about it. So, what are those key nutrients when it comes to? Well, firstly, actually, what is inflammation? Again, I think it's one of these terms that gets used a lot. So, what is it, and then what sort of things can we be doing to support it? It's a good question. What inflammation is actually very good question. <laughs> it's not necessarily just swollen joints, for instance. Um, yeah. it's it's often uh, linked with um, a, a, a sort of with oxidation. So oxidative stress is pro-inflammatory and oxidative stress is caused by a sort of uh, free radical damage, if you like, um, and toxins and uh, but, but, you know various things. Autoimmune conditions, um, if the gut, so dysbiosis in the gut, for instance, which is uh, a very imbalanced, in, imbalanced sort of gut flora, mm. gives rise to inf inflammation in the body. Um, you, I mean, to test inflammation, you, you, there are blood tests, I and mean, you can't necessarily see it. It's 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 a difficult one to to actually quantify. But uh, and we need inflammation. We mm. we all need inflammation, you know, because inflammation protects us. So if we bang our head, you know, you get a lump on your head. That's your body. That's the, that's the inflammation, but that's your body being protected around there so that it can heal whatever you've done. So we need a certain amount of inflammation. But it's chronic inflammation. So, for instance, if you are eating a food like, like gluten, as an example, the gluten, if you're eating, if, you, if, if your body is reacting to gluten, every time you, you ingest the gluten molecule, you will be creating an antibody to fight it, which puts you in a state of chronic inflammation. So your body is just on this alert all the time, if you like. Mm -hmm. And there are certain foods that have a pro-inflammatory effect within the body. And we know inflammation with things like heart disease and certain cancers and things are all linked with with what we call inflammation. So there are certain nutrients that are very anti-inflammatory. Omega-3 is definitely one of them. And omega-3, from a dietary perspective, is pre predominantly found in oily fish. Not everybody eats fish. Not everybody eats oily fish, even if they eat fish. Um, nuts and seeds as well will give you some omega-3, omega so like chia seeds and flax seeds and things, and walnuts can give you some. Mm -hmm. um, but fruit and veg, particularly sort of dark green leafy veg and certain things, you know, antioxidants will definitely have anti-inflammatory 
um, potential. Um, magnesium is a big one, and, and and we will probably talk about that with both PCOS and endometriosis because both conditions are often linked with low magnesium levels, actually. Um, and magnesium is uh, it's 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 one of the most abundant in in the in the body, and it's required for many many different um, uh, chemical reactions. It's very quickly used up when we're stressed, yeah. and it's you know, the way we grow our foods these days, the sort of diets we eat, we don't consume enough magnesium actually. And so, and it's very anti-inflammatory as it happens. It's important for all sorts of aspects of fertility, but from an inflammation perspective, it's very anti-inflammatory. Um, and for both endometriosis and PCOS, it's really helpful. Vitamin E again, an anti-inflammatory antioxidant, vitamin A, I think that I can't see the end of that. Oh, sorry, that's, yeah. a, that's fine, it's fine. I think it's vitamin A, yeah. Which everybody's very scared about, vitamin A, of course. And yes. I think we've discussed this before, haven't we? Um, everybody's very scared about vitamin A when we're talking about fertility and pregnancy because vitamin A is not recommended in high doses in pregnancy. No, it's not. It can affect the fetus. Um, but actually, vitamin A is extremely important for the immune system. Um, it's a very important. It's important for fetal development, in fact. It's just the way you have it. So we, we tend to recommend it in the, in the beta-carotene form, which is the vegetarian form. Uh, found in orangey yellowy foods and dark green leafy foods which is very safe and the body will convert what it needs when it needs it um and vitamin d well vitamin d again that's pretty much the one nutrient you can't really get through food it's not well you can get it through some foods it's, it's not really well well um uh, absorbed through food and so it's the sunshine vitamin hence why many of us are low because a we don't have enough sun particularly if we live in england Okay, I know that um, there is somebody here from Barcelona, but, uh, <laughs> where I hope there's a bit more sun, frankly, than there was here today. But actually, you know, we are told no, you can't go in the sun because it will it will make you wrinkles, it will give you skin cancer. You've got to put factor on, which is all absolutely quite correct, by the way. But it does mean that you will prevent vitamin D from being made, made created in the in the body. And we are becoming chronically deficient in vitamin D, which is important for the immune system for many many things. But one of the things that we're talking about in this aspect, it's very anti-inflammatory as well. Yeah. So as, and I guess we are, I mean, supposedly we are coming out of winter. Um, I'm not quite sure. Uh, <laughs> the weather hasn't seemed to agree with that. But I know the NHS advice is obviously to take it during winter. Absolutely. But would you say that actually taking one all year round is something that you do recommend or someone should be thinking about yeah i mean essentially look um the recommended dose uh is, is reasonably low in this country we're quite conservative uh it may not be enough for everybody I, I'm, I'm trying to choose my words carefully because vitamin d like anything can be toxic in toxic in high doses and you don't just go oh i'll take a high dose of vitamin d that'll do me because it can, it's fat soluble. It will build. It will get stored in fat cells, and it will. You don't pee it out. It's not water soluble like vitamin C or something. It can build up and build up, and it become. It can become toxic. And the aim really of vitamin D in you know in the old days, we'd frolic naked in the sunshine and get all our vitamin D in the summer. Have you know you never. By the way, you can't um, overdose on vitamin D from sunshine. It, it doesn't happen. But then you would live off that vitamin D through the winter. And then, so you'd never get too low. Problem is we never get it high enough in the summer. And so we don't have anything to live off in the winter. Mm. Um, so yes, I would always recommend somebody take vitamin D, you know, and it depends what sort of lifestyle you're living, um, how, what, what pigmentation your skin is. Obviously, if your skin tone is darker, your requirements for vitamin D tend to be higher. Um, I would certainly take it through the winter months and really the winter months in the UK are really sort of fast. I mean, I know it's not technically this, but one would class it maybe as sort of October to March, really, ish, or to at least towards the end of the so November, December, January, February, at least four months, I would say. Um, yeah. But actually, in the summer, you know, if you're going to the office and you're working and you know you're inside and you're not, and then on the, on the weekends you're out, but actually you're putting fa factor 20, 30, 40, 50 on. So actually, you probably won't be creating vitamin D in your skin probably not a bad idea to take vitamin D even once a week once or twice a week it really depends um it's very difficult the only way you can really tell with vitamin D is by by testing it to be honest but yeah but I think it's a good idea to be aware that vitamin D can be low in the summer as well yeah no no that is really helpful and then when it comes to lifestyle um management when we're thinking about both PCOS and endometriosis here what are the things we really need to be thinking about? One for just symptom management, but then particularly when it comes to fertility and trying to conceive. So with the symptoms, 
obviously the food is super important and we've sort of discussed that the types of foods and we will discuss supplements in a minute Re Rebecca I know so we can talk about things that can be really helpful for both of them for managing the symptoms um but from lifestyle adjustments you know uh yeah sleep I mean and sleep is an obvious one but you'd be surprised how many people don't get enough sleep and our body heals when it sleeps you know we, we we need to get a certain amount of sleep and we all again one size doesn't fit all some people need more sleep than others and you can get too much sleep too much sleep actually makes you very groggy and and, and it doesn't you yeah. know you don't feel great but getting adequate sleep is really important and interestingly enough again with the magnesium I find that a lot of people, and we talked about the potential magnesium deficiency, if we do look at magnesium, that really helps with the sleep as well. And people get better quality sleep as well. Um, stress management. We can't take away the stress that is surrounding us. You know, we all have to work. We have family stress and stress around us and stress in the, the world is a pretty stressful place to live in these days, actually. But there, it's dependent on how your body manages the stress. So you can't take away what's outside. But So it's things like mindfulness potentially um, going on to the exercise, things like sort of yoga, gentle things where you breathe properly, where your body, you know, you know, rather than really intensive, high intensity exercise, which is not great for fertility anyway, but it actually puts an extra stress on your body. So it's doing exercise that maybe your body will thank you more for and where you have the breathing, so the blood flow, getting the blood flow around your body, but going back to sort of mindfulness, going back to the eating, man balancing your blood sugar levels, from a food perspective is one of the best things you can do for stress actually <laughs> is and increasing so you need b vitamins when you when, when you're going through stress vitamin c um uh, magnesium so increasing your food intake of, with with foods that are rich in those sources it's very easy to find where you find these food where, where you find these these vitamins and and minerals increasing that managing but but also yes the mindfulness the mind body connection is very very potent so it's doing things that will be able to release the stress if you can there are all sorts of things out there that you can do yeah yeah really helpful and ashley also just said um shared that they started taking magnesium before bed and find it easier to fall asleep now yeah. which is great and i Brilliant. think that yeah something we get with magnesium it helps you fall asleep but also stay asleep as well which i know can also be a problem for some people some people can fall asleep really quickly but then they'll be up maybe every hour or so. Um, so that is brilliant that you found something that works for you. And um, it is, it's great. And it's also the other things like, you know, getting off the screens, maybe having those certain herbal teas that can help, you know, doing other things that can help the sleep. But certainly if you are a bit low in magnesium, it will help you for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the lifestyle, um, the sorry, exercise point you mentioned as well was really interesting. I think it's a question that comes up quite a lot. I think now also as well, these sort of high intensity training um, like sessions, it was quite, got quite popular for like a couple of years ago. Like these studios like F45 are all over the place now. And they're obviously they're great. But when it comes to fertility, and especially if your body is in an inflamed state already, we maybe need to be thinking about how we are exercising and how we're moving our body. Absolutely. And yeah, so for, for fertility, moderate exercise, and we're talking both male and female partner here, moderate exercise is highly recommended because you do want to move, you do want to get the blood flowing around the body, you want to stimulate the you want to, you, you do want to do all that. But high intensity exercise is not recommended for, from a fertility perspective it is too you don't want to exercise to exhaustion but from a male perspective you don't want to heat yourself up too much i mean there's all that that goes along but certainly yeah your cortisol levels will you will increase your cortisol you a lot of people who find they do very intensive exercise actually also find it harder to lose weight because it tends to store it a little bit mm -hmm. you know so and and also as much as you want to get your blood flowing you don't want to direct all your blood flow away from your, your internal organs so it's it's finding a happy medium. Actually, I find a lot of people find that and that's quite stressful because a lot of people will do exercise uh, for their mental well-being. Yeah. And, and that is important. It's just it's understanding, I think, of what what you can do that will work for you and understanding why you're doing it, um, because that can also help. If you know that you're doing something positive, it, it can take some of the burden off as well. Yeah. Yeah, no, really helpful. And a question here from Steph asking if um, strength training and can like strength, yeah, you see the training, strength conditioning, is that yeah. okay? Yeah, I mean, so, so resistance training, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's thought to be good. And, and the strength training, depend, well, again, there is a spectrum of that, isn't there? It depends on, 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 on exactly what you're doing. But yes, those types of things, 
probably it's it's watching the very very heavy aerobic exercise so you know the spin classes the hit classes the you know you, you know you don't want to be training for a triathlon when you're thinking of trying to conceive probably yeah yeah, yeah. hopefully yeah that answered um your questions and then it takes us on to supplements, which is a very big topic, um, of course. <laughs> so I think we do have a few to get through, um, but hopefully um, we can yeah, go through this and there'll be some yeah, valuable information. So we did already mention vitamin D, but I think, again, it's probably so important to talk about um, because it is one of those really key nutrients, isn't it? It is. And actually both women with so 90 something percent of women with PCOS uh, in studies uh, have been found to be vitamin D deficient. It, that, that really is a thing. But again, same with endometriosis, it often goes hand in hand. So these there are certain nutrient deficiencies that tend to go hand in hand with certain conditions. Vitamin D deficiency is, is for both. So um, I don't know. I'll be absolutely honest, because I think it really depends on who your doctor is and where you're getting diagnosed and stuff. But I would really think that it, in any t kind of diagnosis, vitamin D should be tested because it's 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 quite key and actually also key to how you function. You know, your mental health, your your immune system, your physical health, and everything as well. So, uh, unfortunately, it's not a run of the mill. I mean, of course, people do get their vitamin D tested, but um, but certainly you can take a certain amount of vitamin D. But as I said before, it is not appropriate to take the same dose winter summer year in year out well you know it, it's something that needs to be changed yeah yeah very brilliant and then omega-3 um is one that we spoke about earlier with inflammation and i know that you said a good source of omega-3 is fish oil um yeah but if you're not getting like oily fish fatty fish should we be thinking about an omega-3 supplement and is that correct? absolutely and i think actually again we're slightly stuck between a rock and a hard place because we aren't recommended to eat too much of oily fish because of our toxic waters <laughs> um and toxins tend to be stored in fat cells so it, you know we're always re recommended to sort of limit our intake of oily fish and honestly a lot of people don't like oily fish they find it too fishy as well um so but from a fertility perspective women who have high levels of omega-3 um have higher pregnancy rates um omega-3 is really important for sperm count motility dna fragmentation morphology and so i would always recommend as as you know um that i would recommend a good multivitamin but when we can just discuss that a little bit yeah um because you need the basics the folates the b12 the b6 things like that but also i would always recommend an omega-3 supplement alongside um and this particular omega-3 which uh which is our new one isn't it rebecca yes, yes. well why don't you sort of <laughs> you know you, you, you tell us what what the, you know what the difference is yeah so this is actually omega-3 from herring roe which is really rich in omega-3 um the fatty acids but it's actually bound to phospholipids so a lot of omega-3s you get are bound to triglycerides that's not a negative thing however it does require a little bit more sort of conversion um a little bit more, more work for your body to absorb it however phospholipids is the natural form of fat in the body so it is going to be absorbed more efficiently so it is if you have ever shopped um, if you've looked at the z2s supplements before we have our vital dha which is still a really good omega-3 however when we're looking at high levels of inflammation specifically when we're looking at endometriosis when it we might need a little bit more support something like this um, can be beneficial because it's just going to be helping more with that inflammation specifically and the good thing about it as well is because it's from Roe, it's naturally free of heavy metals so they're naturally pure by nature as well so that is just the slight difference in the omega-3s and there's also a really good question from Steph um and was asking can you have too much omega-3 so they're saying they have two servings of salmon a week and an omega-3 supplement daily yeah yes you the answer is yes you can have too much omega-3 but what you're having wouldn't be too much unless your omega-3 that you're taking as a supplement is extremely high potency um but um it is unlikely and uh, in my experience and i've done i used to do quite a lot of omega the rate of uh, testing the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio or omega-6 to omega-3 ratio actually which should be two to one two two six to one three 
I have never yet come across anybody, even if they're eating plenty of oily fish, by the way, who has got the correct ratio unless they are supplementing with omega-3. So I do think omega-3. And again, it's a bit like like the um, vitamin D and stuff. You can build it up. So if your omega-3 is low, so for, I often, you know, say, say people look, if you have never taken omega-3, you, know, take, you can take a reasonable amount, two or three months maybe, and then reduce it, take it every other day or something, it, you know. But with what you, I, um, I don't know what omega-3 you're taking, Steph, but um, if you're eating two portions of oily fish, good, carry on with that. Um, and yes, I would still add an omega-3 supplement because we get a lot of omega-6 through the diet. Omega-6 is found in grains. If you are a meat eater, domestic um domestic animals are grain fed so there is more omega-3 omega-6 in domestically reared animals you get more omega-3 in game by the way um but also nuts and seeds will have the omega-6 we have a lot of omega-6 um food sources to, to hand not so much omega-3 so generally increasing the omega-3 can be helpful yeah, brilliant. And thank you, everyone, for submitting your questions. Um, if I have missed any jumped ahead, I haven't missed it completely. We will come back to them um, at the end, so don't worry. Um, and something that I th we did actually touch on the beginning, where you touched on about the microbiome and how that can be different. I know we're talking about endometriosis, um, but also a probiotic for fertility. And why is this then also so important? Well, so with endometriosis, there is definitely a link Mm -hmm. um with this disordered or, or dysbiosis gut the, with the microbiota the gut microbiome being dis, dis, disordered uh, and which as i said the, the gut is actually the largest immune organ so when the gut is in disarray it can affect our whole overall immune system if you like and our immune programming can be distorted hence autoimmune um but also they it is thinking that the vaginal microbiome and if it is so the vagina which is predominantly the acidophilus um the, the the more acidic it needs to be a more acidic environment it has more of the acidophilus um um organisms but if that is is um is is again imbalanced that is also thought they are thinking that that probably can affect endometriosis and certainly with pcos as i understand it it is quite common with women with pcos to have a uh to not have enough of the beneficial bacteria in the vaginal microbiome so actually um this this works and again it's it's got anti-inflammatory potential hasn't it yes yeah 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 exactly exactly and i think it's when we're maybe thinking about gut health i think also there are symptoms that come with it as well things maybe like excessive bloating diarrhea constipation maybe reflux poor immunity there are links as well which again i don't generally recommend and you can get like a gut test i'd say they're still maybe in the bit of their infancy there can be a lot of money um for mm -hmm. not telling you too much but i think actually us assessing your symptoms monitoring your symptoms can be also a really good way to assess uh, the health of your gut as well absolutely and a lot of for instance uh, food intolerances particularly particularly escalating food intolerances are almost as a result of the gut becoming leaky of the gut wall becoming more porous and it lets um, larger food particles and toxins across and so looking at gut health is really really important in that respect because it can then have a knock-on effect for our absorption and and the way our body functions. Yeah, and really good question from like coming in. Um, it says, I get confused with prebiotic and probiotic. Which is best to increase for endometriosis or should I be increasing both? So a prebiotic is the food that the probiotic, which is the organism lives on. So for instance, the psyllium husk that we have is essentially a fiber. Oh, there we go. It's a fiber <laughs> <Okay. supplement. laughs> that it helps feed, feed the beneficial bacteria. So in foods, think that, you know, sort of the fiber of foods, there are certain foods that are, have prebiotic fibers like um, sort of artichoke. I mean, there are that there are various things, um, various sort of um, families of, of, of foods that are prebiotic. Mm -hmm. The probiotic is the actual organism, isn't it? So mm -hmm. a lot, some supplements have both. Um, the one has to be a little bit careful because some people find that too much of the fiber can bloat them. So it yeah. can cause a bit more gas, can't it? So, you know, if, if you can increase the fiber in your diet, that's great. And, and taking the probiotic probably is going to be potentially more, more, more effective in that respect. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely agree. So yeah, hope that helped answer the question. And then, yeah, like I said, that did bring us on to the psyllium husk, which like I said, helpful alongside a probiotic. Definitely. Uh, 
And actually, going back to talking about the fibre, particularly with endometriosis, that fibre is so important. Um, uh, you know, again, if anybody's got any um, sort of digestive disorders, particularly if you're more prone to constipation or you find it, you know, you think maybe that you don't excrete well enough or whatever, then ex increasing fibre can be really helpful because it also binds with old toxins and oestrogen uh, and hormones, oestrogen being one of them, and with which we know with endometriosis is really important and it gets it out of your system. Drinking enough water as well at the same time, of course, because yeah. then the fiber can bulk out and it lets it makes you pass everything more easily. Mm, yeah. And beneficial as well for would you recommend it's a name husk for someone with PCOS? Is there benefit as well? Well again if you take it, I mean it, it can be good for uh, as a as a food if you like for for the for the beneficial bacteria. Um you know, as I say, some people find that psyllium has too much fiber can, can irritate their gut. So we just have to, it, it, I think it's something that needs to be just, but it can be looked at, but increasing the fiber for, is, is also important. Yeah. For, for, for excreting and, and for, for um, uh, reducing inflammation. Again, we're looking at inflammation, aren't we? Because it helps improve. It, it feeds the bacteria, which can then adhere to, you know, to, to where they need to go. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And then earlier, we were also just talking about yeah, a good quality multivitamin, which I think you said for you is can be your starting point when we're both thinking, I guess, I don't know if you agreed, thinking about sim general just symptom management. We know B vitamins are really important for hormonal health, but then fertility specifically looking at things like folate, which is the active form of folic acid. Yeah, B12. So folate... Folate requires B12 in order to enter the cells. It needs B6 to function properly. And actually, particularly with um, PCOS, with this inflammation that we talked about, there's often a higher, there can be higher levels of this pro-inflammatory um, uh, compound metabolite called homocysteine, um, which, um, uh, it's, which is not beneficial. It may be linked with um, recurrent miscarriage. I mean, there are various things that, that we don't want it. So, reducing inflammation so reducing the the, the homo and it's pro-inflammatory reducing homocysteine is really important and homocysteine requires folate b12 b6 so it, i'm never a fan of just taking one nutrient i i think most nutrients require well as i always say they need a friend basically most nutrients need a friend to help them along and they work more efficiently together so you 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 know but again we um it's always important i, I would prefer always prefer people to take nutrients in their active forms rather than synthetic. So folic acid is synthetic, folate is active. Uh, you know, the B vitamins that, that are used in that are active. Therefore, the body recognizes and uses them more efficiently. Yeah, yeah, no, brilliant. And then this is actually a, a bit of a newer one for the Z2S range, but I think a lot of research um, for NAC for, I don't know if you agree, for PCOS and endometriosis. Absolutely, I love it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so. NAC uh, turns out is this sort of super thick. It's, it's an amino acid, okay? So an amino acid, amino acids are building blocks of protein. Uh, it's a potent antioxidant. So actually it's been sort of, as, as we, we sort of know at the moment, there isn't actually a study for egg quality, for instance. But uh, so I often look at sperm quality, obviously and something that's good for sperm quality has got to be good for egg quality because we're looking at the workings of the DNA. Um, but NAC can uh, reverse DNA damage in sperm. So we love that. It can reduce D uh, DNA fragmentation. Um, it uh, is very anti-inflammatory. So for PCOS, it helps reduce, uh, it can help with insulin sensitivity. It can help reduce testosterone levels and normalize ovarian function. Um, it has been studied with recurrent miscarriage. So it helps increase pregnancy rates, reduce risk miscarriage rates. And NAC also works really well alongside uh, the FEMC, for instance, alongside a probiotic for the vaginal microbiome, because it can actually help uh, break down what's called a biofilm, which um, is uh, which catches all these bacteria and keeps them there, which we don't want. All these harmful bacteria, it gets rid of them. Mm. So it works alongside. So it's got a lot of benefits in that respect. Mm. So for PCOS with endometriosis, the anti-inflammatory, uh, the antioxidant, because we know that there's a lot of oxidative, a, a lot of oxidative stress uh, comes goes hand in hand with endometriosis. So antioxidants are very very important, but also the inflammation but it really helps, it can reduce endometrial pain and it reduces the size, of, the size of the endometriomas actually. So the studies show, so it's got a lot of benefits um, and I've had some great results with it. So um, yeah, I think it's well worth, um, well worth a try. 
Um, and you can build up, I mean, some of the studies are done with quite high doses, but short term. So again, we could look, you know, one can look at sort of lower doses, but long term. Mm. Yeah. And really interesting. Kerry, thank you so much for sharing your experience. Kerry said that I've had such an improvement in pain about four months into taking NAC. Really brilliant. love it, which is brilliant. So and good. Elena just asked if you can take too much NAC. Uh, a bit like anything, you can take too much, you can, you know, you can take too much water. So, but some of the studies are done with quite high doses. And when I say, high, you know, I'm sort of talking um, 1800 milligrams, you know, so you can take quite a lot. Mm. Um, but with everything, it's better to start slow. And sometimes less is more, you know, you don't always want to just go, right, oh, we they, they've studied it up to this. Let me take the highest dose. Yeah. I'm not sure that's always the way to go. Um, because sometimes you can still get benefit from taking less. You just yeah. need to find what works for you. Yeah. And another question has come in and asking whether NAC can be continued throughout pregnancy and again, at what dose? Yes, it can. Uh, I w Certainly it's been studied um, 600 milligrams in, in, in pregnancy up to 1200. I tend to say leave it at six probably um and certainly taken up to 20 weeks it helps reduce the risk of um uh of miscarriage it has been studied alongside potentially maybe reducing the risk of preeclampsia that can actually be taken throughout pregnancy is it necessary to take throughout pregnancy i'm not sure it is unless you are at a higher risk yeah. but certainly if you have had recurrent miscarriage if you're at a higher risk of miscarriage and stuff it is definitely worth considering and i would say at least take it for the first trimester but you might want to take it you know up until 20 weeks but it is it is, seems to be safe to take uh, um not at super doses i probably would be careful I, I i can't wouldn't be able to give you any any sort of kind of guarantee on that at all but generally at, at a sort of reasonably average dose like 600 milligrams actually uh it seems to be perfectly safe yeah, yeah, we're getting actually loads of questions in about NAC. Um, so I'll answer one more and then we can try and come someone to the end, just make sure we get um through it. Um, but question from Catherine asking if NAC can help with egg quality. Yeah, I think it can. Again, we don't know, do we? But certainly it's been studied with, with sperm quality. It's a potent antioxidant. I use it a lot. Uh, in in my clinic um, with uh, women who are maybe a little bit older and who we need to try and support everything. It's a potent antioxidant. We know antioxidants are important, but as I say, it has been studied with sperm DNA fragmentation. It can reduce DNA fragmentation. The egg is also a casing for strands of DNA. So really, if it's going to do it in the sperm, it must be able to do it in the egg. Um, so yes, I believe that it can help with egg quality and I use it, it to that end, by the way, in my clinic as well. Yeah, I think doses wise, I'd say probably there is so many different studies looking different dosages. Probably the range is what from about six hundred to eighteen hundred milligrams. I think that's probably <clears throat> the most common. But well, like with endometriosis, what they did was they um they took six hundred milligrams three times a day for three consecutive days. This is a study they did for three consecutive days of the week. So let's say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for three months. But I often say, I mean, that people can't be bothered to, to take it that much often. It's a lot. I mean, I will often say, maybe do 600 milligrams twice a day, but, you know, all week or yeah. even once a day. Do you know what I mean? You, you can yeah. have, have a little bit of flexibility. Yeah, there are ways of doing it. Um, but, uh, and you know, generally, I'm not sure you have to go, as I said just now, I'm not sure you have to go to the highest dose to get to, to still get results. Yeah. Yeah, no, brilliant. And then this is another really big one. Um, myonositol and a question earlier from Caitlin asking if myonositol can help with insulin resistance because yeah. uh, I know that's yeah really big kind of conversation about it it is and it, it it is probably my sort of would be my first port of call with PCOS definitely it can help with um insulin it increases insulin sensitivity which is what we want because obviously insulin resistance yeah. is when the insulin isn't functioning properly so it increases insulin sensitivity again it is anti-inflammatory it reduces um, hyperandrogenism, um, so high testosterone levels. It normalizes a bearing function, so it can it can basically bring on ovulation potentially. Um, it also has anti-inflammatory aspects, and actually, inositol, my inositol is found in the follicular fluid, but it turns out it's good for egg quality as well. Um, <laughs> and um, it can it's great for the liver, as is NAC. That's another super thing about NAC. Fantastic for liver support. 
uh, which again is very important in particularly endometriosis we talked about because we need to clear out all the um, old hormones from the liver so that's another reason it's important but um, inositol and folate and by the way inositol and NAC can be taken together they have a lot of the same functions as it happens but they can be taken together and I, I would always re recommend them together really for somebody with PCOS because um, but it, and the studies are done on four grams, four grams of, of inositol um, and alongside folate. So ours has got extra folate in, but I I would, would never have it on its own. I would always have this alongside the vitafen, the multivitamin, because the amount of folate in this is not in is not the rec it's not the recommended dose from a conception perspective. But also women with PCOS may uh, that, that there is a higher chance potentially of, of a a genetic variant whereby your body requires a bit more folate so it may not be the case but it can be very helpful if, if, if that is the case so it can help with the homocysteine levels and would you ever recommend an inositol to someone with endometriosis or is it mainly pcos that you see the studies no i mean with endometriosis no not particularly um i think it's more within you know and again my own inositol has been um studied with potentially reducing the risk of gestational diabetes as well so if, if, if somebody's at a higher risk of gestational diabetes it is something i would can potentially consider in pregnancy as well um but yes with endometriosis i mean again you know if if you think that egg quality is poor it may help and it's been it, but it's the studies with fertility really are done with women with pcos more than anything and then one that we actually don't think we've mentioned yet, which seems like a surprise. So I feel like we are always talking about CoQ10. Mm -hmm. um, but this is, again, something that is used a lot in fertility, but specifically with, can it help with PCOS and endometriosis? It can, actually. So with PCOS, again, it, ha it can help reduce testosterone levels. It is anti-inflammatory. It is great for egg quality um and so it, it's it, it's it's and it's so anti-inflammatory obviously for endometriosis it will help with that um it's it's great for egg quality and particularly if um anybody is going through ivf when your uh the aim of an ivf cycle is to stimulate your ovaries obviously to produce a lot more eggs than just the one that one normally ovulates with and as the egg is the largest single cell in the female body, uh, essentially, it uh, you need a lot of energy to, to to mature an egg. And with IVF, you need to mature lots of eggs. So CoQ10 not only is a potent antioxidant and it can help reduce cellular damage and, you know, combat cellular damage, if you like. But it also um, is an energy provider. So it may help with egg maturation, which is one of the things they think that it why it helps improve IVF outcome. It's sort of, it's, it functions a dual fold in that particular respect. It's great for sperm as well, by the way, great for morphology and DNA fragmentation and all that kind of thing. So, um, and as we get older, our own production of CoQ10, like with everything, we get less efficient at it. So certainly as we get older, it's useful, but I always recommend it even for young women going through IVF. If you're going through IVF, the CoQ10 can be helpful, but yes, for PCOS and endometriosis, it can be helpful. Um, yeah. Brilliant. And then a, a good question from um, Alex um, was asking, when you begin taking supplements, how long does it take to have an improved um, effect, particularly on quality of eggs? How long is a piece of string? <laughs> um, so the, the recommended obviously time for prep, if you like, from a fertility perspective and the, the maturation cycle, if you like, of an egg and sperm, but is sort of two and a half to three months, about three months. But um, I think that you can probably see benefits before that. And I, you know, I think three months can be, it, it can be quite stressful thinking that you have to do something for three months or you haven't got three months because actually you've been fast tracked up your IVF thing and mm -hmm. got IVF starting in a month's time, which doesn't mean egg collection is in a month. It will probably mean that egg collection is in six to set to eight weeks, which is a good amount of time. So, but I think you can certainly see, um, effects quicker than that i would have thought but it's impossible to say i mean i, I couldn't possibly give you a, an absolute answer to that yeah and a few people asking whether you can take coq10 alongside nac which is yeah completely fine absolutely. they're very different things absolutely all of the things that, that that are in in the packs all of the nutrients that we're talking about can be taken alongside each other because they're all very different and you're not what you're not doing is overload overdosing on a, a specific vitamin because they're actually that they're, they're slightly different so nac is an amino acid rather than a vitamin for instance coq10 I'm not sure it's classed as a vitamin actually i'm not sure what it's classed as is it classed as a vitamin i should know this shouldn't i yeah, sorry yeah. everybody 
<laughs> yeah, I don't actually know what they class. Yeah, because it's not I don't think, yeah, but it's not a specific yeah. thing. There is actually currently, there is no specific dose. I mean, again, we've got the, uh, what used to be the RDA, which is the recommended daily amount, which is now the NRV, the nutrient reference value mm. of, of, of nutrients, which was set about a thousand years ago, wasn't it, Rebecca? Well, <laughs> many years ago, <laughs> it was set, the bar is set very, very low. So for instance, the, the NRV for, for vitamin C is 60 milligrams, which is pretty much what you need not to get scurvy. So the bar <laughs> is set very low. Which is why, because I get a lot of questions about why there's such huge doses of stuff in, in, in supplements. Um, nothing is, is, is dangerous in a multivitamin. It's all very carefully put together. Um, and it might be that it's sort of 200% more than, than the RDA mm. but it, or the NRV, or whatever, but it's, it's, it's absolutely fine. Because, you know, what we're looking at optimizing rather than just, you know, get, not getting scurvy or not just, you know, it's, it's not just keeping away from illness it's actually being well if you like yeah. and it's it's the cells thriving yeah brilliant and sorry we will um we will kind of wrap well not rush through but we will finish up um the last few slides to answer all of your questions um but i mean magnesium you have spoken loads about um this evening and this is actually exclusive for you guys we do have a magnesium coming very soon um so we will share all of that information but i think takeaway magnesium definitely key you can find it in foods as well but supplement might be also be something worth trying and best taken in the evening often because it can help with sleep as you mentioned a bit earlier on rebecca so magnesium can be really helpful and you know if you've got you know again with constipation again with headaches you know with with sort of muscle cramps with palpitations with you know things like that can all potentially might be helped alongside which might indicate that you could just do with a little bit of magnesium boost but from a fertility perspective really helpful yeah brilliant brilliant and then just a quick note on if you are going through persisted fertility treatment is there as well any considerations that should be made anything either supplement lifestyle dietary wise that we want to be thinking about if you do have yeah pcos and endometriosis just to further support that anything that you would maybe recommend differently so definitely obviously that what we've discussed with with you know increase a high antioxidant diet a higher protein look for ivf particularly what well, for fertility per, per se a higher protein lower carb mediterranean style diet is always recommended um for ivf your protein requirements go up so the the aim of an ivf cycle is to stimulate your ovaries to mature as many present follicles in a safe environment and with pcos there can be many follicles, to be fair. Um, that's the aim of the medication. The medication can't feed the eggs. So it's your job to feed them. And it's not all about the protein because each egg is the casing for strands of DNA. And the DNA requires uh, folate, B12, B6, vitamin D, you know, all, all these things that we're talking about. So your nutrient intake becomes exaggerated, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, so that definitely is something for IVF. But even for IUI, it's it would be the same as uh, as looking for a natural conception. It's just following a diet that is helping with balancing your blood sugar levels um, and to my, trying to optimize egg quality and sperm quality. And egg freezing, of course, is IVF, but without the end result, if you like. It's just it's so it's the same principle. Your protein requirements are much higher. You know, you need to. I tend to look at nutrition around IVF as an exaggeration. So with IUI, it's more helping a lot you know the sperm is is you, the, you know you are very gently stimulated maybe to make sure that you're ovulating your, your ovaries are induced and the sperm is actually put into the uterine cavity you know um it, so 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 that it doesn't have to swim so far whatever but actually your body is not doing anything particularly different with ivf and egg freezing which is ivf your body is being asked to do something very different and it, it is it is an exaggeration it is an exaggeration with with, with food for sure yeah, okay, brilliant. And then just, yeah, finally, um, holistic approach. And I guess this goes alongside quite nicely the lifestyle. We're talking about stress management. I guess these are just additional things you can do for that. But also lots of um, research actually about supporting blood flow as well. Blood flow, hormone balance. And certainly with acupuncture, there's been a lot of study done on uh, having acupuncture, you know, pre and post embryo transfer. Um and uh, not everybody likes acupuncture. Some people, you know, obviously, you know, if you don't like needles, it's maybe not for you. Um, but reflexology can also be very beneficial. Uh, you know, it's it's sort of thinking outside the box, as it were. It's, it's doing it's it's looking around and 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 doing other stuff 
sometimes also just for waiting if, if you are in in the medical sort of process waiting for a scan or waiting for a blood test or for a doctor's appointment it can be really stressful it's doing something proactive for yourself the food is one thing the taking the supplements is not but there are other things that you can do just to keep yourself sane but also to help from a it's not just it's not i'm not talking placebo these are proper there yeah. is a lot of research as you said behind all these as well yeah no brilliant um, so we, um, sorry, we rushed it through um, the last bit there, um, but just wanted to make sure that we could get on to all of your questions. So do make sure that you are also just staying up to date. So we have lots of, sort of content on Instagram, our website, loads of blog posts, loads of great information if you want more things like the NAC, information, diet, have a look at those. And then of course our mailing list as well, just so you can stay up to date um, with more webinars, IGT TVs. Um, the magnesium product as well will be listed on there. And both myself and Isabel also run um, free product calls. So it's like a 20 minute um, free call. You have no obligation, but it's just if you, we know that supplements can be very overwhelming. Um, so if you did want to discuss um, with either of us, you can use that QR code um, to book or head to the website as well. Um, but we've got some really great questions um, coming through. So I will try and get through as many as possible. Um, if you do have any other questions, please use the um, chat function as well. So let me have a look. Question from Nike. Good starting point. Are there any extra considerations for vegetarians? Um, we have mentioned protein, vitamin D and omega-3. But what about B12? Um, thanks. So if you're a vegetarian, you can get B12, obviously, from things like eggs and and and. and you know, eggs, probably, um, potentially dairy. If you're vegan, you cannot get B12 from a vegan diet. So it is, but either way, I think this is another reason to take a multivitamin, which contains B12, so that you're not just taking a folic acid or a folate or something. Yes, yes. so it's it's harder to get, it's, it's impossible to get B12 from, from a vegan diet. It's harder to get it from a vegetarian diet, but it's certainly doable, certainly with eggs and stuff like that, you can do it. Yeah. And sort of along um, the same line, so for PCOS and IVF, would it be best to follow a vegetarian Mediterranean diet or okay to have a non-vegetarian Mediterranean diet? Would that either one be better? Um, if you are not a vegetarian, I would recommend a non-vegetarian one because the fish is great. It's very anti-inflammatory protein and some lean meat is fine as well. So, but you know, like most of us we shouldn't be eating too much meat and so therefore it's but having some is absolutely fun but certainly the fish can be great um so yeah i don't think you need to follow a vegetarian diet and question from steph said would it be more important to reduce bmi by a calorie calorie control slash restriction or should the focus be getting on getting in all the nutrients um and bmi not be so much of a focus uh, BMI, I think, can be an issue, yes. And I think that um, the thing is, is that not all calories are equal. And so just by going on calorie is not the way to go because you can eat very badly um, mm -hmm. by going, oh, that's low calorie, that's within my calorie range, I'll have that and it's a bag of quavers, you know what I mean? So just going on, on all oh, the crisps are available, it's going on calories, <laughs> probably not the way. But if your BMI is high, probably having some calorie restrictions, not a bad idea. The problem is with calories is that you find the calories really a lot in fat and good fats are important. So you don't want to let, sort of cut out all fats and low fat diet is not recommended from a fertility perspective. So it's a mixture of both. It's a bit more in depth that question um, than just being able to answer it quickly, I'm afraid, but if that gives you a little bit of a yeah, sort of no, answer. Okay. Thank you. And question from Jessica asking about the supplements. Are they like safe or can you take them all together? And is your body going to absorb them all? And is that a best way or a best time to take them? So um, sometimes it might be better to start slowly and rather than throw, if you've got a whole pack, for instance, rather than throwing everything, you know, right, I've got my pack on a Monday, let's start throw everything in on a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Your body might get a bit shocked it, you can also if you're getting a higher nutrient intake it can improve the way your liver detoxifies which can mean that you're releasing the toxins that can give you headaches and things you've got to be a little bit careful sometimes um yes they are designed to be safe to take together 
but if you've got something that is two so for instance in the vitafem or whatever which is two a day you are best to, to have divided doses if, if you can so you might be better to take things twice a day and on the whole things are best taken around food because a it does stops you from feeling sick <laughs> but also it means that you are producing digestive enzymes to break the food down so you're breaking the nutrients down um nac is something that can be taken away from food but most of the other things should probably be taken around food if possible yeah i don't know i think we actually had a few questions about nac i think sometimes people can um struggle to take nac um I just is I mean I have personally I don't know whether it's one of these things a bit like a coriander where some people can't have it and others fine I personally have never noticed a smell with the NAC but I know very some people yeah find it very sulfurous cannot find it really tricky to take would you have any advice if you are struggling with taking NAC uh, it is sulfurous I have to say you're you're right and pretty much every NAC I've come across is sulfurous yeah. um you could try keeping it in the fridge it doesn't it doesn't repeat on you to be fair i don't think it repeats on you and it, it, it again probably i'm a bit like you rebecca i i'm not hypersensitive in that respect it doesn't really particularly bother me uh you try taking butyric acid which basically smells like vomit so i don't think anybody but that's another story altogether so the nac is not too bad um there is i, I don't think there is a way around it because i think they are all quite sulfurous aren't they mm -hmm. rebecca so um as i say sometimes putting things in the fridge if you you know keeping things in the fridge it, it, if you, yeah, you realize that if you keep something on a warm window so it always smells a bit doesn't it so keeping it yeah. in the fridge might help that might that might be the answer yeah yeah, yeah. and would you say taking it with food um uh, would be better in that sense it might but i don't think it repeats on you so it, it yeah. sort of depends it, you know maybe start with food see how you get on and then if you find that you can take it quite easily with food and take it away from food yeah that's also another with the fridge i know someone recommended that with omega-3 as well if you really don't like the yeah. smell of an omega-3 capsule keep yeah. it in the fridge um, and with omega-3 actually if it does repeat on you take it at night mm. That is, yeah, I think definitely, and this is something that we spoke about a bit that sort of trial and error one size doesn't fit all yeah, yeah. There's just, I think, have a little bit of a play around with when you're taking the supplements, what food you're taking with it and see what works best for you. Absolutely. And also the doses that are there. I mean, for instance, there, you know, I've known people who can't tolerate more than 100 milligrams of CoQ10, for instance. Mm. It makes it feel a bit weird, a bit wired. So if, you know, and, and actually this particular girl I'm thinking of was desperate not to stop the CoQ10. She's like, so good for my egg quality, but it's not suiting you it's not suiting you, you know, then it might be doing you, you know, a bit of a disservice. So yeah. again, sort of be sensible and always ask advice. Always ask advice. If you, if, if you get a headache, if you feel sick or whatever, always ask advice um, and your pee will turn a fluorescent yellow with a multivitamin. It's yes. perfectly safe and it doesn't mean that you're not a sore bigot. Yes. Yeah, no, that's always a very good point. And I had a question um, from Chris earlier on and asking if there's any supplements to help with the cravings that come with insulin resistance. Well, actually, the, uh, the um, inositol can help with that potentially. Um, inositol may help with that. But the best thing for the cravings is increasing your protein and reducing your carb. By balance, it's your it's your blood sugar being disorgan disorganized, <laughs> disorganized, disordered that um, is causes the cravings. If you like, when you plummet, then then you're you know you're, you're, you 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 crave. So eating regularly with protein each time that that, that the, the diet becomes very important in that respect. But yes, the inositol may help with that. Magnesium can also help. That is another reason magnesium is helpful. Magnesium um, is very important for blood sugar control. So you might find that. That, that that would help too because the magnesium is really important for balancing your blood sugar levels chromium yeah. is another one yeah but um certainly magnesium in the inositol yeah perfect and yeah we will just do one um last question if that's okay with you as well um and it's from ruth asking whether intermittent fasting is okay for pcos um again it sort of depends how you're doing it the answer should be yes because actually intermittent fasting has been found to help with um uh, um, glucose, you know, with insulin function. Um, so what I tend to say is um, when you break your fast, so be it, I mean, there's the, the 16, 8, there's all sorts of different ones. Mm -hmm. But when you break your fast, break it with a protein-rich meal. So or don't break it with a piece of toast, not probably, or, or a smoothie or something like that. Break it with something that's got protein in. And in your eating window, make sure that you eat on a reasonably regular basis. So if you're eating, if you're doing the 
the 16-8, for instance, then have you break your fast, maybe have a, a, a snack or something, a handful of nuts or something after four hours, and then you have a meal or whatever. I don't know, however you do it, but don't then sort of break your fast and then have another eight, sort of seven hours before you eat your second, you know, you're only eating twice. So you have this long gap because your blood sugar is, is not going to thank you for it. So when you are actually eating, make sure that you balance your blood sugar levels within that window by eating some kind of protein and, and the things that we discussed before. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Isabel, for sharing um, all of your amazing knowledge. And I hope everyone who joined found that um, really helpful and hopefully took away some actionable tips. Um, we are available for any help, support. Um, if there's anything that you are unsure about, want to clarifying, then please pop us an email, um, the customer service at c2westproducts.co.uk. Um, we're always on hand. Like I said, um, Isabel and myself run free product consultations that you can book from the website, uh, c2west.com. So definitely have a look at those as well. And we'll also be sending a recording out of the um, webinar as well. So you can watch back if there's any points you missed. So yeah, thank you everyone for joining and thank you all for your messages coming through now. Uh, lots of people as well are saying that it was yeah, really informative. So thank you again for your time. Oh, you're and welcome. Yeah, well, we will let um, as well. We'll let you enjoy your evening, and everyone else um, also have a great evening. And thank you so much for joining us.